Well, click, click, get ready for your Kodak moment. Welcome to One on One, a Bluff City Media podcast. Listen in as we go one on one with coaches, players, and influencers from across the city of Memphis and around the country. Now, let's get to the show. What's up, everybody? Christian Fowler here with Bluff City Media, and welcome back to One on One. This week, I have Memphis head coach Ryan Silverfield with me. Coach, how you doing? Good. How you doing? I'm good, man. Glad that you're here. Excited to see you. Uh, we're coming off the hills of spring ball. How was it this year? Yeah, it was great. Look, I was quite pleased with the way the guys competed. You know, we started back in January and just talked about a, a fresh start to everything, and I wanted to see the guys go out and improve every single day. We stayed healthy for the most part, but I got to see the guys go out there and compete day after day after day. I thought we got better. I'm excited about this roster. So typically, you know, as as a coach in your career, this time of year you're bringing in eight to ten guys, maybe early enrollees that are playing in spring and with, what, I think 18 transfers this year. What has it been like, you know, especially this season, you guys brought in so many people. What's it been like managing all – the new freshmen coming in that are early enrollees and then all the transfers as well. Yeah, I think that's, you know, college football this day and age. Let's yeah. just say what it is. The, the nature of college football is there's going to be about an average of 35 to 40% roster turnover on every college football. Uh, you talk about teams like the University of Colorado, Arizona State that have had uh, major influxes and changes in the roster. But uh, for us, it was about just making sure everybody was on the same page more than anything. And it always goes back to, the coach speak of culture and our standards. And from the very second we got back and they started classes and we had the first team meeting and a lot of new faces was just understanding, hey, this is the way we do things. This is what we're all about and this is who we are and, and laying the groundwork for that. And, you know, you got returning players that understood a lot of those leaders that said, okay, yeah, this is the expectations. These are the standards of our program. And then getting the rest of the guys to buy into it. And it's been phenomenal to see because we've seen different guys step up. We've seen these guys that have come from all over, right? Whether it's a 17-year-old that's getting ready for prom that's early enrolled or a, a transfer that's been a, a couple years starting the SEC coming to our Memphis program, buying into our culture, doing it the right way, and then seeing success. And so that's been a pleasure to watch. Obviously, it's an everyday deal. we got to continue to teach it and preach it. Uh, but I've been quite pleased so far. I'd be remiss not to ask you about the offensive line. You're an offensive line guy at heart. It's, what, it's where you came from. So bringing in so many Power 5 transfers this year, Marcus Henderson, Xavier Hill, uh, Chris Morris, who was at A&M before he went JUCO, what was it like kind of having this influx of size come into the offensive line this spring? Well, I think you can never have enough depth at the offensive line. Yep. We've said it all along. I think if uh, you're lucky in college football, if you feel like you've got eight or nine guys that can play. And – you know, obviously you hope you stay healthy, um, but we, we got to continue to bring in guys that will battle and compete. And I think bringing in bigger body guys that have had, you know, maybe power five experience uh, can always help. Um, but they're all three of those guys you just mentioned uh, have the ability to come in and compete and, and work. And so it's made us better up front. And the nice thing is that's a unit. You talk about the cohesiveness of the entire team, right? How does it blend? Everybody's asked this off season, like, how do you deal with that, right? Just trying to get these guys to buy in. Are they friends? Are they, what's a locker room look like? Or do they, you know, bring in different people to your family? And, and that group of all need to be on the same page. And they've done a phenomenal job. We have a new offensive line coach in Jeff Myers, who's done a fantastic job of getting those guys to buy in to the way he wants it done as well. And uh, I've been pleased with them, right? They've got, it's still a work in progress like every offensive line, but adding those new uh, faces will certainly make us better. So if you rewind two years ago, you're going into the offseason, you got Grant Gannell, you got Seth Hennigan, two guys that really didn't have much starting experience. Grant has started a little bit at Arizona. Obviously, Seth was a freshman. Going into this season, you have a true junior quarterback that started over 20 games over the past two years. What is it like going into the season with a veteran quarterback you know, versus a, a young guy that's really never stepped onto the field before? Yeah, you're exactly right. It was funny. Two years ago, about this time, that was a question. Who's our quarterback going to be? Who's right. our quarterback? And most people just assumed, hey, it's going to be Grant Gannell. You know, started at Arizona, had success in the Pac-12. And, you know, everybody said, well, there's no way you're going to actually roll the dice and start a 17-year-old quarterback <laughs> right. that can't, can't grow facial hair. <laughs> um, I think everybody that understands who Seth Hennigan is, the intangibles, and, and Grant's a, a, a fine young man and wish him nothing but the best in his career. But, you know, Seth is one of those that has the it factor. He, he's smart. He's tough. He cares. And, um, you know, be able to go into a true freshman season, you still say, okay, there's going to be a lot of learning mistakes. And, he, you know, year one, learning the offense, still, you can learn it and he can be smart, but you're still trying to comprehend it on the field of play. And then 
year two, it's not only just understanding the offense very well, but then understand what are these defenses doing. So feel more comfortable. Now year three, okay, taking over this offense and maximizing it. Hey, you're the coach on the field, Seth. Go yeah. handle it. Go take it. Go take care of it. Make sure you're putting us in the best situations. You see if the safety rolls down. You know the check you need to make. You need to know what you need to do, how to change the protections yourself. And uh, he's taken the bull by the horns with that, you know, this offseason. And it does give you comfort. You know, he's the only, I believe, in this country – uh, two years starter that was still 19 years old when the season ended. Yeah, it's crazy. And so he's still young. And I go back to, you think about Brady White, who obviously everybody knows our relationship. Uh, you know, he was a 24-year-old quarterback at one point, and we've been dealing with a kid that's, you know, 18, 19 years old, um, and who's got maturity um, and, and has all those things you want to have success. But he's still young, and I think the sky's the limit for him this year. So Memphis has kind of been tabbed as playmaker U over the last several years. Antonio Gibson, Kenny Gainwell, Daryl Henderson, Patrick Taylor, Calvin Austin, like the list kind of goes on and on for some of the skill position guys that you've put out. Uh, and this season, a, a new group comes in. You got Demir Blancomsey from Toledo. You got Towski Dove uh, from Missouri, Blake Watson, Old Dominion. So bringing in like a, a new wave of playmakers, what do you expect from your skill positions this year between your receivers and your running backs? I know you've got a lot of bodies there and a lot of depth. So how excited are you to see kind of those two position groups this season? Yeah, I think that's the biggest thing is, you know, over the last few years, we've had some success at the skill position. Uh, we know what we were, you know, when we truly had all those draft picks, but uh, getting to be more explosive. And that's a key. And that was one of those things this off season. And even during the season, you studied, okay, we're going to bring in bodies. Can they help us be more explosive? And, you know, you talk about those names, you know, I think every single one of those guys brings a different element. And you're right, you not only add depth, but you add guys that can go out there and make plays. And right. that's been the key, you know. You, you run the ball for uh, four yards, and you'd like to get see that thing get eight yards, right? Or you run the ball for 12 yards, and you'd like to see it ripped. Hey, let's go for a long touchdown run, right? A deep pass rather than being tackled right when it's caught. Let's go do it. I think that, and then you see the growth of guys like Rock Taylor, Mm -hmm. You know, that you, you mentioned, you know, Joe Skates has got to continue to improve and, and he'll bring his game just along just fine. But I think as you see those guys grow, it'll make you better. Sutton Smith, a guy in the backfield that we've got great expectations for. You know, Blake Watson, he was hurt most of the spring after uh, with a little bit of clavicle injury, but he'll be full go. Jay Ducker. So we're seeing some of these guys that I, I think are all capable of carrying us at a high level offensively. Um, but that's the biggest thing is how can we continue to be more explosive? we got to do a good job schematically of uh, putting the ball in their hands in the right way. All right, Coach, let's switch gears a little bit. I want to talk about you a little bit. I know you <laughs> <laughs> you don't do that very often anymore, um, but I just want to talk about your journey, how you got here. So growing up, like, did you always want to be a coach or was it I want to be an NFL player? Like how I, I guess where did the love of the game come from and how did you get to this point just briefly? Yeah, look, I was just your average a high school football player. I've been the same size since ninth grade. Truly, I mean, it's one of those. So, um, but fell in love with the game more than anything. I think I, I appreciated everything the game did for me. You know, I was fortunate. We were uh, on our high school team. We we're the number one team in the country my sophomore year, and we had a coach, uh, Corky Rogers, who was at the time uh, the, the wingest high school coach in the state of Florida history, and a true legend who did the right way, who taught us how to work. And, and to get better and, and really you know, instilled so many things in me that it was like, this is going to make me a better person when it's all said and done. And so the game had taught me so much as it has so many individuals throughout time. And, you know, I had a neck injury. I, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't destined to go play at a place like Memphis. I just was never going to be good enough uh, or big enough or fast enough. And so I started coaching spring of my senior year of my high school. And, uh, just with fortune and timing, it's one of those you say, well, an injury, you, you feel sorry for yourself. But then I fell in love with the idea of actually coaching. And at the age of 20, at a small college in Virginia, Division three school, very similar to Rhodes College, a place called Hampton Sydney College. They gave me my first opportunity to be a full-time coach. So when I was 20 years old, I was actually a defensive line coach, a full-time coach at the college I was at. And I think that's when you sit there and say, okay, not only do I have an a, a opportunity to coach and, and do something I love, but even though these guys may have been the same age as me, even some of them older, I felt like I was making a difference in their lives. And, you know, that was one of the biggest things is that's something that is invaluable to make a difference in a young man's life, to hopefully instill in them so they're eventually better husbands, better fathers, teach them work ethic, teach them uh, teamwork, things that are getting lost in our society. I still, to this day, even 25 years later, hold dear my heart that are important to me and the way we go about doing things. 
So, as you mentioned, you didn't play college ball, and that's, I mean, that's a rarity, like, for coaches not to play, especially head coaches. Did you ever run into any roadblocks with that, like, throughout your coaching career of people questioning that or whatever, thinking they were holier than thou, saying, oh, you never even played at the collegiate level? What was, what was it like navigating that throughout your career? Yeah, I mean, look, there's been obstacles for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, even my first year coaching in the NFL, everybody says, well, you know, you, one, you didn't play college football. You don't have a famous dad, you know, you didn't certainly didn't play in the NFL. Why the heck are you here? And you look at some of those NFL staffs and it's like, Oh, I can see why these guys got certain jobs. And in my whole deal, and it'll always be the same as if I can provide something to an individual that will benefit them, that will allow them to play longer, that may put more money in their bank account, you know, especially in the NFL, then they're going to listen to what I have to say. And you have to prove it. And that's one of those things. Like my first year in the NFL, we had a guy named Jared Allen. And Jared's yeah. <laughs> a close friend of mine who lives in Nashville now. And mm. Jared Allen had signed a, you know, coming over from the Chiefs, a, a $69 million contract with the Vikings. And Jared Allen did not need to listen to this 28-year-old, you know, defensive assistant tell him, hey, this is how you rush the passer. But if I could show him one thing that may allow him to get another sack, well, wait a second, this guy may know what he's talking about. Let me listen. Hey, Jared, have you thought about this and that? Yeah, no. And then as long as you can provide them with something that's going to benefit them, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Yeah. And so then, oh, wait, now this guy's got cred. I'm going to listen. And then it's no different, right? You always, this generation of uh, student athletes, right, even now, I could bring in a true freshman. They always want to know the why. And I think that's so important. Uh, I don't mind sharing the story. I had, was able to sit down with Fred Smith, obviously, uh, of FedEx, one of the most important people in, in our country and, and at one point in our world you know, with what he was able to do and one of the most successful men. But and not just because of FedEx, but, you know, I was talking with him just like this. And I said, you know, the biggest difference between generations. And he said, well, let me show you. So I pulled out a picture of him when he was going to war at age 18, a young Fred Smith. And he said to me, he said, Ryan, he said, we're going to war. Nobody asked why. He goes, but now every 18 year old that I hire for FedEx, guess what? They want to know why. Mm -hmm. And so a long winded answer to your question is now we just show these guys, hey, here's how this is going to benefit you. Here's why we hold you accountable. Here's why we do things the way we do. And it goes back and then in their brain, nobody on the field has ever said, wait, you didn't play college football, so you right. don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> right. So over the years, right, 25 years into this thing, sure, there's been some ebbs and flows, uh, but no one's ever sat down with me recently and be yeah. like, wait a second. You know, sometimes I just point to the, the Vikings home or Lions home and they say, yep, coach yeah, me, coach. I, I, think you, I think you've made enough progress <laughs> now to where that shouldn't be questioned, but I think it is cool that, that you had that progression and then people see that, okay, he might not have played, but he knows what he's talking about. So I'm, my ears are on. I'm going to be listening. Uh, you mentioned coaching with the Vikings. 28 is when you started in the NFL, right? That was your... Yeah, so my first year coaching the NFL was 2008. Yeah. Um, and that was with the Vikings for six years from 2008 to 2013. How did you make that jump? Like, you're starting at Hampton, Sydney as a full-time coach. Fill in the gaps between that. How how did it progress? I know you were at UCF as a GA for a time, but... How did, it, how did it get from Hampton, Sydney to the Vikings within, what, four or five years maybe? Yeah, so for me it was all about, you know, how could I continue to grow in this profession? And without ever playing college football, it was, okay, where do I learn? How do I continue to? I was one of those guys that would, you know, find ways to sleep on the office, to continue to study ball, to show up at every coaching clinic, to take notes and, and sit in the front row, call people, ask questions. And I think that was, you know, the thirst for knowledge and trying to be a sponge to get better as a coach uh, really helped me. And that's why I encourage all these young coaches. Sometimes they just, well, I just want to be, I want your job. Well, yeah, that's great. But it's also taken 23 years to get to this seat, you right. know? So, um, but one of the things is, you know, for me, it was, okay, how do I continue to work? How do I continue to meet people? So I went from Hampton, Sydney. Then I was a 23 year old head high school coach in Savannah, Georgia. Um, it, it was, it was fun. I was 23 years old, really didn't know what I was doing, but uh, it, it was a blast. I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot, you know, when you're coaching, uh, a head high school team, you know, when you're a head coach of a, a small team, you, you learn how to do everything from paint the lines of the fields to right. coach offense, defense, special teams, clean the toilets, whatever it took to make sure the program survived. Um, then I went from there to Jacksonville University. I was a quarterbacks coach. So I've, I mean, I've been D-line coach, right. quarterbacks everything. coach at, at Jacksonville University, and then got on as a grad assistant at University of Central Florida. And uh, a lot of famous coaches actually were on that roster with me and, and some of those connections I made and then fortunate enough to get my foot in the door with the Vikings. And um, from there, you know, the, to then uh, was over at Arizona State and that's where I met Mike Norvell. 
Um, in the middle of the season, the Detroit Lions hired me. So then I went to Detroit and then, um, I accepted this job. I actually, me and Coach Norvell talked about, let's not make this public, but he wanted to make it public because of what, with, with recruiting and everything. Mm-hmm. And I was actually his last coach that arrived here in Memphis. Um, but my last game coaching was against the Chicago Bears, January 3rd, uh, 2016, I believe it was. And then I was here in Memphis, January 5th. And, I, you know, I was coaching at Soldier Field knowing, hey, I'm going to go back to my office in Detroit, pack my stuff and come to Memphis. And I've been here since. So I, I do want to talk about the time with the Vikings a little bit because you were around some stars. You mentioned Jared Allen, one of the best yeah. pass rushers of all time. Uh, and then on that offense, Brett Favre, one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time. AP, one of the best running backs of all time. And then Sidney Rice, Percy Harvin. Like there was Duke, Br- Bryant McKinney, I believe, yeah. was left. I mean, there was that those teams were stacked, absolutely loaded teams. What was it like being in that environment? Because I imagine if you're on a losing team, it's it's never as fun, but when you're on a team that's that good, has that much star power, goes to the NFC Championship game, what was that time with with the Vikings like with all the with all those amazing names on it? Yeah, you know, it's funny. You sit back, and you, when you're there, you don't appreciate it. You just said, well, this is a coworker, right? Adrian Pearson's just a coworker. Well, Adrian Pearson will go down as one of the top running backs of all time, right? right? Brett Favre, if you, well, you're sitting there eating lunch with him in the cafeteria at the time, this is just another day. player. Yeah, yeah. Like, there's no difference. But you think about how remarkable they are in the history of the game, right? We even brought in Randy Moss the second time around. Mm-hmm. And I sit back and I, you know, I see Randy on TV. I'm like, huh. Was, you, know, you just always think about the different interactions you had. Mm-hmm. And then you see people with a, a Randy Moss or Brett Favre jersey. You're like, oh, wow. Well, these guys were obviously legit famous and uh, had success on and off the field. But um, you, you grow to appreciate it, especially those that, you know, worked really hard at their craft. You know, Brett Favre's best statistical year was a second to last season with us. Mm-hmm. Um, so when we went to the NFC Championship game, played the Saints, you know, bounty overtime, gate. get bounty gate. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't bring that up. But then when you think about it, <laughs> yeah. I mean, think about it, head coach of an NFL team was suspended an entire season Yeah, because of something that occurred. Uh, it's bizarre. You know, it, I don't think it still gets enough pub what occurred. Brett took a beating in that game, too. Yeah, um, a, I don't mind sharing this publicly, but it's in, in, uh, probably only in this uh, setting. But post game in the NFL, you shower with your players. Yeah, obviously they're grown men, and um, Brett had known to be a little bit of a jokester. And uh, we're in the shower in the uh, the Saints dome after the game. It was a tough loss, we, and we had five turnovers lost in overtime. And yeah, as media rolls out, and people start to shower and all that stuff, and. We're both, I guess, near each other in the shower, and he starts hitting my arm. Hey, Ryan, Ryan, I go, now's not the time. Like, I'm not in the mood to, you know, and I'm certainly sure he wasn't. He points to the back of his leg. He goes, look at this. And the back of his leg had already started swelling and bruising. Mm. And you sit there and say, what the hell is that from? I mean, you, you think maybe over time of getting hit. Right. But it already started, the bruising on the back of his legs just from that game. And then you go back and you watch the film, and you look at it, and you say, my God, that, that, those were some... Vicious hits he took, brutal. and uh, but you go, and then sure enough, Bounty Gate comes from it, and people are suspended and cost people their jobs. But all that being said, you know, but with Brett Favre's best statistical year, you go back and look at him. He was a guy that could have come to the office whenever he wanted, could have left whenever he wanted, but you know, he ended up showing up at six a.m. every morning. You know, there's times you'd leave the office at midnight and you'd say, "Why the hell is there a light on the quarterback room?" You go in there, and Brett Favre's just sitting there taking notes, notes, notes. So. The preparation of some of those guys and what they were capable of doing, it uh, kind of just continues to prepare you and it's one of those things you can never lose sight of. For sure. And then, like, throughout that tenure, I just remember this from, you know, obviously being a huge NFL fan forever. The I think it was against the 49ers. It was either, it was either in the playoffs or right before the playoffs. Off the back foot, Greg Lewis, back of the end zone. What was what was that moment like? Because like for me as a kid, I was was that oh was that the oh nine season? I'm oh nine sure. season. Uh, it was in the Metrodome, the old Metrodome, which right. is now I don't know. I think they still play some baseball games. Yeah. No, the Twins don't. And it was going towards the visitor locker room at the right corner of the end zone. Brett Farr throws it. And, uh, he was wearing number eighty seven, and Greg Lewis was back of the end zone, game winning catch. And it's so funny because now you know you see Greg was. Uh, He's coaching the NFL. Yeah. I think he just moved on. He was with the Chiefs in the Super Bowl. He's mm-hmm. with the Eagles and stuff. And he got into coaching soon thereafter. But, yeah, you, you think about games like that, and you just kind of remember and reflect. And those are games that you always remember. Um, and just some of those memories sometimes just even in the locker room uh, because of the, the people you have the, the opportunity to be around. 
Also beat the piss out of my Cowboys that year <laughs> in the divisional round. <laughs> badly. Yeah. Very badly. Yeah. Um, so what what was, in that time in Minnesota, like what was the moment that stands out to you the most? Like when you think back, when you reflect on it, like what is what is that one moment that, that kind of catches you the most? Yeah, you know, I think talk about the NFC North that we were in, and I enjoyed that, and I enjoyed the time around some of those guys. You know, we were – 1.9 yards short of the all-time rushing record Adrian Peterson yep. was. And you sit there and say, man, you know, it could have been cemented in legacy. It fell nine yards short of Eric Dickerson's record. So you kind of go back and look at some of those milestones and monuments. Obviously, being able to play in the FC Championship, playing a wild-card playoff game uh, in Green Bay. Mm-hmm. You know, one year we actually played the Packers three times in a month. Everybody says, well, how the heck does that happen? Well, they were scheduled for back in, you know, now there's 17 games, I believe. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but back in the day, we're, they were game uh, 12 for us. Then they were game 16 for us. Then the wild okay? card round. Then the wild card round. And so you sit there and play them, or game 13 for us in 16. Then you sit there and uh, play in a wild card game in Green Bay. And you want to talk about the frozen tundra. Now, Minnesota's cold, but they always had the dome. Right. And playing a playoff game in Green Bay. Yeah, I'm still cold from I, that day. I believe it, man. I would, I would probably die. I'm probably missing a small toe because of the frostbite, <laughs> but you know. Um, so then after that, you you mentioned you trans your transfer. That's where I, that's where my brain's at yeah, right no now. Question. Uh, you leave and you go to Arizona State for a second mid season for the in the NFL. You go to the Lions. How how did that go down? Yeah, so you know, I was at Arizona State and just kind of hanging out and. Um, you know, they gave me some fancy title that all these coaches have now, right? Senior offensive analyst. Right. I don't know what the heck I was. <laughs> uh, but that's where I had the opportunity to meet Mike Norvell, who uh, to this day still remains a close friend and one of the reasons I'm sitting here today. And uh, in the middle of the season, Jim Caldwell, who's the you know great head coach, um, reaches out to me. And at the time, the Lions were 1-7. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's like, look, we're making some changes. So they end up getting rid of their general manager their offensive coordinator, and both their offensive line coaches. And he said, you know, we've got Dom Capers, the D coordinator of the Packers at the time. They got the Packers twice. Um, he said, we're, we're going to make some changes, and uh, would you be interested in coming up here and joining us, see if we can get this thing turned around? Well, in my mind, I'm like, they're 1-7, and seven, so even if you finish 2-14, and 14, I'll, I'll be back you know, looking for a, a, job a job and trying to figure this thing out. And uh, Very fortunate, went up there. Uh, Jim Caldwell is one of the, the, the best coaches, of the biggest class acts, and and all of life, and uh, got a lot of respect for him. He's obviously the one that, you know, with Peyton Manning and right. the Colts and the Tony Dungy Disciple, and I was with the Tony Dungy Disciple and, and um, Leslie Frazier up in Minnesota. Mm-hmm. So had a lot of respect for him, learned a lot about leadership from him, went up there. You know, the the really funny, the story of the night Mike Norvell got this job uh, here at Memphis is the same night we were playing the Green Bay Packers in Detroit, Thursday night football. The, we were beating the brakes off of him. The Rodgers Hail Mary. Darn Aaron Rodgers Hail Mary. <laughs> Last second play, maybe 56 yards. I get, you know, you, unfortunately, you remember some of the things that just like torture you and uh, catches it for a touchdown. Or else we would have had the biggest turnaround in NFL history and finished seven and one. Yeah. And, and instead, we were six and two. So we were able to get on there and keep our jobs. But, um, but that was the same night Mike got the job. And him and I talked about 3 a.m. in the morning. Uh, him, was, him, extremely excited. You probably still yeah, pissed off. Yeah, exactly. And he said, "Hey, you want to come to Memphis?" No, I'm just trying to get over this loss. <laughs> right. And uh, all that being said, it's just funny how all those things correlate and come together. But um, you know, that time in Detroit was great, and had the opportunity to stay on there. And then it's funny, you know, you get things turned around in Detroit. Okay, hey, you want to stay in Detroit? And then uh, there were some other things that you know were offered to me uh, in this coaching profession, and you know, I just said, you know what, I'm just gonna let's move to Memphis and. and call it home and, and see what the heck happens. And, you know, it's so unique. We're, you looked at this past season, I think there's 612 Division One coaches changed jobs. Now, that doesn't include GAs and QCs. That's head coaches and full-time coaches. So of the 10 full-time and then the head coaches, 612. So what we're seeing is this constant uh, rotation of people always taking jobs. I mean, the average coach stays somewhere for about two years. Um, and, you know, to, to kind of find a place that, hey, this is home, be happy at it, it's been unique. So I, I definitely want to get there. I want to talk about, you know, going into Memphis and what that was like and transitioning from O-line coach to head coach. But before we leave the NFL stuff, this is just because I'm an NFL <laughs> junkie and not – if I'm getting to talk to somebody that, that was there, I'm going to talk to somebody yeah, that was there. Um, what was, what were some of the the craziest, like, superhuman feats you saw between, you know, players and, pra- and practices when most of this stuff happens? That's when you hear stories of, like, all this 
crazy stuff happen that no one gets to see. So what were some of those moments or some of those specific players that you saw throughout your tenure with the Vikings and the Lions? Yeah, so, you know, Jared Allen and I will I could probably tell stories, but not for media. So <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I, yeah. have, I mean, I have a history of things off the field that uh, we've we had some fun together back in the day. You know, you, you talk about a guy like Calvin Johnson. Right. Complete class act. I mean, one of the best dudes I've ever been around. I mean, just a professional was fantastic. Uh, love the organization. I know they've had, you know, some riffs, but Calvin Johnson was absolutely perfect. Uh, Percy Harvin may go down as one of the best athletes I've ever seen. Yeah. Um, that's what they, everybody says. Is that you he go and watch insane. Percy and, you know, obviously there's some history there with some stuff off the field, but man, just fantastic athlete and actually, you know, tough, rocked up, put together, mm-hmm. but you go watch some of the stuff he was able to do. You say, Holy cow. Um, yeah, just, just quite amazed every time you put the ball in his hand. You, you talked about a guy like Adrian Peterson, right? Adrian Peterson would show up sometimes. We'd have a 8 a.m. team meeting. He'd show up, you know, 7.59, 59, eating McDonald's ice cream for breakfast. And yeah, he's got rock hard oh, abs yeah. and looks good. And I'm like, man, I'm jealous. <laughs> yeah. I wish I could eat McDonald's ice cream for breakfast and look that good. Uh, you, and, you know, you talked about with just what with Brett Favre and, you know, I mean, the very first time he threw a football. In fact, I still to this day, this, this finger is actually bent the wrong way. Um, that's from trying to catch a Brett Favre pass. So that's why I always say that's why my fingers are jacked up. I blame him. <laughs> yeah. Um, but just, you know, being around those guys and just some of the stories, you know, those guys have been around and, and the history, it, it, I think going and playing places like playing at the old soldier field, going and playing in Lambeau, you know, even the old Metrodome, you know, had its deal and you get to go see some of these crowds and these atmospheres. It's really unique. And it's funny because I always try to talk to our players about like, listen, guys, you know, we've got guys on our staff that have played in the NFL, but, you know, having the opportunity to coach in it, it you just see things in a different light with our guys. And uh, I think it's something I can constantly, you know, implore to our 18 to 23-year-olds on our roster right now. Absolutely. So making that move uh, from the NFL to Memphis, clearly that was something that you felt like was the, was the right move. I know the NFL – crazy up and down schedule is nuts not that your schedule isn't nuts now <laughs> yeah. but like you said trying to find somewhere that that really felt like home how much of a role did that play in coming to Memphis I think that was part of it I think when you go from okay spend six years in Minnesota and uh great place not a fan of the cold weather <laughs> yeah. and uh then you have the opportunity to you know you're it, really what happened with you know just trying to figure out what I was next my next stop in the career is almost kind of like a mid-career crisis right you know been coaching since I was 18, you go, go, go. And then all of a sudden it's like, all right, what's next for me? Right. And to get in the NFL at a young age and then try to figure out, okay, here's a pause in my career um, and trying to find the right fit. And I just said, you know, wherever I go, I want to be committed to. And there are some other um, situations that presented themselves. I just said, you know, is this stable? Is this something long-term? I had a lot of faith in what we're going to try to build and do here. And uh, kind of just said, screw it. You know, I didn't look at the money, didn't look at any of that stuff. I just said, this is this is what's next. And uh, let's make the most of the situation. And, you know, even being here, and I know we're going to get into this, is just, it was like, okay, even when the other opportunities came, it's like, and I, and I try to explain to our guys, even in the portal, like, you got something really good. You don't always have to look and see if there's something better out there. Absolutely. And then, so you get here, were you, were you the, were you offensive line coach when you got here, or were you assistant? Yeah, assistant offensive line coach, or you were the offensive line I coach, was the correct? Okay. Line coach, yeah. So you get here as the O line coach. Obviously, Fuente had started building this thing. Norvell comes in with his vision. How did he frame it to you? How did he get you so excited about coming here and being a part of this program? Well, you know, he's got an infectious energy, yeah. and um, I'd been around him, and it was interesting. You know, they they were six and six at Arizona State, and you know, he wasn't sure if he was going to get this job. Um, you know, he had looked at this in another one, but this was a job that he felt like he could have success at. And, and I said, you know, that record at Arizona State should not be a reflection of the type of coach that uh, Mike Norvell is. And, yeah, we just said, hey, let's come build something together. And um, and I said, okay, I'll stick by your side and we'll, we'll get this thing going and um, put a lot of faith and, and trust in each other. Um, yeah, most of the time I think when you're with somebody for four years, especially with what how involved he was with the offense and the quarterbacks and – Got to have an O line guy that you can, I guess, hang your hat on, and vice versa. And so, um, we just kind of said, okay, yeah, you know, here we go. And but we did have a belief, right, Coach? What Coach Fuente was able to do here, kind of get this thing going. Um, and and look, all those coaches and the players in the past, obviously, had, had built this thing to where it needs to be and where it is today. 
Um, but, it, you know, it's just excited. Okay, here's the opportunity to kind of hopefully be somewhere for a while and, and see where we can take this thing and, and possibly just, okay, get back into college football and enjoy the ride. Yeah, for sure. And then the momentum started building pretty quickly. I mean, you get you guys really put together some classes, obviously had some good good breaks with players. I mean, you don't always know if players are going to pan out. You guys had some that did, especially at the quarterback position. Um, so in the midst of it, I know you don't think about it while you're in the grind, just like you were saying with the NFL. It's just your work. You're at work. It's day to day. It is what it is. But looking back now, like those first couple of seasons and, and feeling it build and being like, okay, we have legitimately some of the best players in college football. It doesn't matter that we're at Memphis. We have some incredible talent, um, a ton of draft picks, first round guy in Paxton Lynch. Um, what was that like? What was it like, at least in the off season, kind of being able to look back and reflect and going, okay, I did make the right decision. Like this thing is, is running right now. Yeah. I think just being happy with where you're at and what your roster and being able to do it the right way. Um, and all along, not just winning football games, but, you know, truly feeling like you're having an impact on these guys. And the rules were even different six years ago. You right. Know, eight year, you, there was no transfer portal. There was no um, off season of saying, okay, I, okay, I get this offensive lineman. I get the opportunity to develop him for four or five years. And that was fun. Um, obviously, that's gone out the window. <laughs> that's gone now. <laughs> and, you know, and I look back and I sit there and say, and you hate to say this, but like, how about some of those guys, would they have still been around? You know, you had a guy that was an All-American um, would he still be around the next year ha had we been in today's uh, way of college football? But mm -hmm. no, you did. You got to sit back and say, wow, we've got a lot of talent here. We get to continue to develop it. Um, fantastic people along the way that we were able to bring in, not only on staff um, that are, you know, making their own mark, but also, you know, players. And, and you kind of, it's been fun to get, you get to watch some of those guys that have either had success in the NFL or e even in life and you continue to pull for them. So I can remember several years ago, just the momentum building and everything. And it felt like for I think probably two off seasons, it was like, is Ryan going to stay or is Ryan going to get it? You know, a different job because the way that the <laughs> offensive line was playing the way that, you know, just the run game in general, the pass protection was, it seemed like the writing was on the wall that, okay, Ryan's going to be gone. Like someone's going to come calling. Someone's going to offer him a situation or enough money to where he's gone. I mean, what you, what you did on the offensive line, I mean, if you just look at the guys, Drew Kaiser, Trev Trevon Tate, uh, Gabe Coon, like the list goes on and on of guys that were not necessarily heralded recruits, Dylan Parham. Like I could sit here all day and give you guys that weren't necessarily yeah. heralded recruits that you turned into, you know, all conference type players or guys that went on to play at the next level. So was there any thought to leave? I, I'm sure there was offers and conversations with other coaches and stuff. Uh, what was that? What was that like? Because being recruited by another team and being, you know, someone trying to bring you in, I'm sure is something that you dealt with uh, uh, multiple times throughout your career. So what was what was that process like? Well, full credit goes to the players. I mean, I'm 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 an average coach, and those players made me a better coach. And and we had some good running backs, so I looked a lot better. <laughs> with, you know, when Daryl Henderson back there carrying the rock, but you know, I I I'd sat down with Mike, you know, almost every off season and said, hey, look, I'm I'm happy. You know, I'm not chasing stuff and. I never once called about jobs. Um, in fact, right after bowl games, I had actually fly and get out of town because it would prevent me from having to worry about my phone. This was different. Right now, now after bowl games, you sit there and talk to your current players. Hey, let's not leave. Don't let's leave. not jump in the chance for <laughs> yeah. But for, you know, reality for three years, right after the bowl game, I'd get out of town and just go kind of catch my breath because recruiting was dead and didn't have to worry about anything. And it, plus it'd be hard to get in touch with me if I could turn my phone off for 10 days and yeah. didn't have to worry about jobs. Um, but there was one off season and I, and I don't mind sharing this where, you know, I had, um, had some opportunities and I interviewed with in the same day. In fact, I told Mike, I said, I'm not going to go out and interview for jobs because I don't think that's fair. I need to be where my feet are at. And, and the same day in the same suit, I interviewed with, uh, you know, went down to uh, Alabama, interviewed with Nick Saban. And then that evening had dinner with Les Miles. And then, about midnight that night, got a call from Mike Vrabel. So I said, you know, this is, uh, I sat there and I said, what am I going to do? And then the next day I went to Norrell's office. I said, too many options. I'm just going to stay here with you. So, <laughs> was he shocked? Like, uh, he, you know, but I think he knew deep down that like, look, this is about um, a loyalty to, to a place and kind of really happy where we're at. And uh, I think that's important. I think we get too lost in what else is out there. What else can we do? Um, what's better, the grass is greener. And we always say that all the time. I don't know if I'm here the rest of my life, right? But I, I'm really happy where I'm at. There's different challenges to mm -hmm. being the head football coach at the University of Memphis than there were last year than there certainly were 
seven years ago. Yeah. Um, it's an ever changing deal, but you know, we're going to stay on top of this thing and, and have success. I understand about winning more football games and going to win a championship. That's obviously the number one goal. But, um, you know, when you figure out like, look, we got a good situation here. We can do things at a high level. Um, it wasn't about it. And, you know, I said, Hey, I'm going to just continue to be the best coach I can be for this university, the best steward of this community and, and pour into these guys and see what happens. So then we get to the 2019 season. Obviously that's, that's the peak. That's the top. It's the best season in school history um, with college game day, with the conference championship. It was just, it really did from very early in the season felt like a magical kind of year. Yeah. It's one of those years they say every time a team wins or has success, sometimes it just feels right. Sometimes that ball bounces a different way for certain <laughs> teams. And that's the way that season felt. It felt like the stars aligned that entire year. What was that like? Same thing. I know you. Uh, we've talked before. In the middle of the season, you were thinking nothing about what's going on around you. But now I know you've had plenty of time to reflect on it. What? And that's also the, you know when Mike transitioned out and you trans transitioned in at the end of the year. What was that season like? Well, you knew we knew we were talented, right? And you knew there was high expectations um, going in. You, you got to see at the time we knew what UCF was, but we also knew what their roster was and you got to see this growth of Cincinnati, right? I mean, we knew that, uh, it, you know, years prior that Cincinnati was, you know, uh, not where they are today. Right. And you got to see kind of um, where these programs w were stayed in. So w we had a chance to make a run at this thing that year. And I go back to this. It's really unique to say, and I, I mean this, you know, with laughter, is had the true freshman kicker at Tulsa <laughs> yeah, made a 20-something yard 27 field goal, yards. 27-yard field goal. We're not sitting here today. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> college, college game day does not come to Memphis. No. Um, coach Norvell may have been a head coach somewhere else, um, but it's so unique because a 27-yard field goal was missed versus Tulsa. Probably changed a lot of things for a lot of people. Absolutely. And had he made that, would it have been the magical season when college game day had been here? Probably don't think, not. Don't think and so. And so it's just – so when that happens, you sit there and say, sometimes the ball's got to bounce your way. Absolutely. And, you know – I don't, I'm not one of those and believes in, hey, luck and timing and the ball not bouncing our way. Look, the, we can go back to name a couple of games this past few years that I said, man, if I had the ball bounced our way, but you got to prepare better, and that's on me. Um, but, yeah, that season you kind of knew that something was special. And um, towards the end of it, uh, Mike and I had always confided in each other about the things that were occurring, and um, the opportunity presented himself to go to Florida State. And I think it's, you know, me being from that way, it was like, hey, it's, I don't think it's an opportunity to pass up. So then going into the Cotton Bowl, once again, first time Memphis has been, New Year's Six Bowl game, and it is your debut as a head coach. Yeah. I don't I don't think you were probably extremely nervous, but what what were you feeling like when you're when you're realizing, okay, we're one of the best teams in the country. We just won a conference championship. We're playing in Arlington in the biggest bowl game in school history. Did the moment get to you at all leading up to it, or were you pretty pretty calm throughout that time? I think those that know me know that I was pretty calm the whole yeah, time. Yeah, I couldn't see. I mean, I just, out. and that's one of the things. It's funny, you know. You meet people, and they say, "Man, you just have the demeanor." And part of it I learned from, you know, a guy like Jim Caldwell. Like, there's so many outside things that occur. I've got to be in a mindset that none of that stuff bothers me. It's no now. There's distractions, and you think about it. But everybody did tell me enjoy it, enjoy that moment. So when you run out and you, you know, arms locked. I remember vividly, you know, with, locked with Jacoby Francis, and you know, just sitting there thinking about, it, okay. That's pretty cool. First yeah. game as head coach versus Penn State. Man, I'm going to enjoy this thing. And then during the game, to me, it, we could have been playing Sandlot football. It was another game. Obviously, I wish I had done a better job when we won that game. But, you know, that's how any of the games are. I don't think of it. You, you just got to be so focused. And I challenge our players the same thing. You know, just be so dialed in to the environment. The, the, the status of the game shouldn't matter. And you go back and I look at the history of Memphis, how we, you know, we've played bad at Tulsa. We've played poorly at Tulane. We've played poorly at Temple. And I always ask our players, what is it? Well, the atmosphere, all this. Well, we can't. We can't let that. It doesn't matter if we're playing Ole Miss or Mississippi State. Well, how can we play so well when we play these SEC teams? Well, the environment. It shouldn't be about that. Right. It should just be about the focus. And so for me, um, anybody that's come watch generally my mindset and my approach is I'm so dialed in that whatever else happens, happens. Whether it's uh, practice on a Wednesday of spring football or if it's the Cotton Bowl that uh, you can't let those things phase you. Yeah, and I'm going to ask this just because I'm a Cowboys fan, but I, I was in the stadium. 
I've never seen anyone in person play as well as Micah Parsons did that day. Yeah, I wish he'd declare. You know, some of these guys are declaring yeah. for the NFL before the bowl game. Right. I think it had that young man declared for the bowl game just a couple days before. Might have won that one. I might have a cotton ball ring on my finger instead. Um, it's the first time I saw it. We, we ran a trick play reverse to Kenny Gainwell. Mm-hmm. And Kenny Gainwell is a legit NFL player. 4-4, four, 4-5. Four, 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 yeah. yeah, I have. And, yeah. you know, we run it all practice and no one's getting to it. And I'm like, all right, here we go. Reverse. Micah Parsons runs through the A-gap. And tackles Kenny Gainwell down on reverse. I said, man, that guy's really good. And then another, we run a, a slip screen out to Antonio Gibson, also a guy that started as a running back yeah. in the NFL. And I see Michael Parsons take off from the backside and go make a tackle for uh, no gain. I said, man, that guy's a little bit different. And then sure enough, he's you know probably the best linebacker in the NFL. Yeah. So as a Cowboys fan, you guys got yourself a health kill linebacker. Had I wish he not played versus us? <laughs> yeah, yeah, because it may have changed it. He was a... Uh, but you could tell at one point why he was so special. Oh, yeah. I, I remember sitting in the press box, and I had obviously just being a college football fan, I had seen Michael Parsons before, but like texting Kenny because he's down on the field, I'm like, this dude is absurd. I've never seen anyone in person this way. I mean, it, it, was, it was crazy. He yeah. played one of, the, one of the best defensive college football games that I've seen in my lifetime. Um, so transitioning into that Cotton Bowl, you get to the offseason – are you one like what is your what's your mindset in that time? Are do you feel pretty confident that you're going to get the job? Are you worried about what? So what is you it know, like? I had actually there was a seven day window, so I was you know um, I na- got named interim head coach after the the conference championship game that night, mm-hmm. and um, I was actually supposed to go get on a plane with Mike the next morning after he talked to the team and go. He wanted to introduce me in Tallahassee. Yeah, and um, you know, the president the AD reached out to me the night after the conference championship game late night and said, hey, you're going to be named the interim. Uh, you have the opportunity to interview for this job, but we're going to interview a bunch of other candidates. And I believe I was the seventh interview for this job. Um, and, you know, I, I spent that whole week, you know, everybody says, did you prepare for the job? No, I went and recruited and, and you know, got with our staff and told them that, hey, this is, we're just preparing to put ourselves in the right, prep, you know, preparation for the Cotton Bowl and, and then also to make sure this recruiting class looks the way it needs to. And uh, interviewed for the job. And then, so I actually, um, really seven days after the championship game was when I was named and you know, quickly ran to a press conference. And then from the press conference, after being named head coach, ran to uh, a recruiting visit. And uh, it's been nonstop since. Yeah, absolutely. So over the last couple of years, you, and you kind of hinted at this earlier, the ball hasn't always bounced the right way. There's been a lot of those games. It's like if this, and this, you can nitpick any game, but it's like if this one thing would have been different, you know, we could have been ten and two this year. We could have been nine and three this sure. year, but it doesn't always happen that way. What has I don't want to say frustration because I know you take it as it comes and it is what it is. But what has it been like just being being so close and having a lot of those moments over the past couple of years? Yeah, you know, I think it's it's always gonna always put it on me. It's I've got to do a better job putting us in the right situation so we can have success. I think it's easy for coaches to re- deflect things and say, well, with this and that and. If, I'd, if this player had done that, no, that's my job uh, to make sure our staff and the players are in the right situations to have success. So ultimately, it's on me to find, okay, how can we be uh, better prepared? How can we find solutions? Um, sometimes it may be scheme. Sometimes it may be changing of personnel right. um, in order to put us in the best situation. And so those are the ones that frustrate you. Yeah, we've lost games here. You know, I go back and you know, we lost. Uh, think about when we played Missouri last mm-hmm. time we played Missouri. It was, I think, it was like forty-two to three at halftime. It was bad, and we had one of the most talented teams we've had in Memphis, mm-hmm. and we were uh, rolling. We had some good players, and Mizzou kicked the crap out of us. That game hurt bad. But then you go and look at some of those close losses. You know, you think about back-to-back years in overtime versus East Carolina, um, games capable of winning. You know, does the trajectory of the season change had we beat Houston this year? You know, right. obviously that one sticks in your stomach and, and, and makes you sick because had we recovered an onside kick, had the refs even thrown the flag on that where they said they were off sarge, we apologized. Um, had we made one of those tackles on the fourth and 12, had we be able to convert a first down? Those are the things that you sit there and say you're close, but that's my job is every week, every season, okay, how do we prepare ourselves so we're not even having those questions? So next time we play East Carolina, it's not an overtime game. It's we're winning the game the right way. Uh, have we have the opportunities to – to have a lead to be able to finish a team off. So um, I'm constantly studying that, constantly looking at ways. Uh, have we been close? Sure. Had the ball bounced our way 
a little bit different. Yeah, but I can't play that game. It's just got to put us in the re- the best places uh, so we are uh, in the best opportunities to go have success. Yeah, and I feel like going into this season, the conversation from a media perspective is like, this is it. Like, this is the this is Ryan's important season. Like, he has to do something this year. How do you view it? Because everyone wants to have their own storylines and make their own own, you know, their own storyline of this is how it is behind closed doors. What is it like for you going into this season? Yeah, I, I treat it just like any other season. You know, kind of what you and I were talking about before even coming on air was every season has been completely different, right? When I first got the head job, <clears throat> COVID, you know, and it was a completely different circumstance, a completely different way of going to do things. And you talk about that just then all of a sudden this transfer portal opens, then this NIL. So it's a different world year in and year out and a different uh, roster, different situations. I don't sit here and say, okay, hey, this is what it's got to be or else. No, I, I, nobody's going to put higher expectations on themselves in the program than I am. We have got great expectations for ourselves to have success. Uh, we should be competing for championships. Make no bones about it. I, I said it even when I got the job. The minimum expectation is to compete for bowl games. And uh, But this is a year that we should go out and have some success. Um, I don't sit here and say, oh, wow, what, SMU has twice as much money as us and they can go get players in the portal that we can't afford. That's neither here nor there. The average fan doesn't care. Go right. out and prove it and win games, and that's what we're going to do. So correct me if I'm wrong here, but this is basically your team now as far as recruiting goes. I think the majority – or any of Mike's guys left, maybe a, a couple that yeah. are fifth years. Yep. But majority, this is this is your team. These are guys that you've recruited you know, from the time you took over until now. I'm not going to say. Uh, does that instill more confidence in you that this is that this is fully your team? I'm not saying that those guys that were Norvell's guys sure. weren't your guys or anything like that. But is it is it a different feel that knowing that you pretty much brought this whole team in? Well, uh, and I, this is even my first year there. They're still my guys, right? There's right. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But, um, yeah. The reality is, it's it, you just know. Okay, hey, this is the way we've been able to build it. Uh, it has it had to be built uniquely. Uh, the NCAA hates the term roster management, but that's where we're at. Um, but it does, gives you great confidence because, you know, even going in the spring, everyone says, well, how talented are we? Are we did we add enough pieces? Did we do? We're, we're talented. But what gives me great confidence is the mindset and approach of these guys. They've been phenomenal, the buy-in. And then we talked about it earlier, just, you know, understanding, okay, this is the culture. We talked about, you guys have heard me use the, the phrase all in. These guys are all in, and it's been so much fun because they care, they work, they're willing. They've got this mentality of this is the standard. We're going to bust through the damn standard, and we're going to prove to you, we're going to prove to everybody what we're truly capable of. And that mindset and the, that approach of the guys on the roster, that's what gives me so much confidence. Absolutely. So we're gonna, I'm going to hit this last question, then we'll get out of here. Um, it's not like you haven't had success at all. <laughs> I feel like that's how people frame it sometimes is that, not been success. I think you're the first coach to have back-to-back bowl wins at Memphis, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's – obviously, that's that's a big thing for this program is going to bowl games and winning bowl games. It, it continues that relevancy. But in this conference with no Houston, with no uh, UCF, with no Cincinnati, how, how – I don't want to put – I don't want to go too hard on you, but you go. how important is it to win a championship with – you know, less competition. Let's call it what it is. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if it's less competition. You watch what Tulane was able to do last Absolutely. year. Absolutely. Tulane just had five draft picks, I believe. Um, you know, you look what SMU is able to do. SMU bought in 27, I believe, Power 5 transfers. transfers. Yeah. Charlotte has bought in 24 Power 5 transfers. So UTSA. UTSA. Uh, I mean, it, it, so it's just, it's it's no different, right? Like, when we first got in this conference, Cincinnati was not very good. No. Uh, in fact, Zach Taylor, the head coach of the Cincinnati Bengals, was the offensive coordinator at the University of Cincinnati. They were actually the worst-ranked offense in the conference. <laughs> and so I always say it works in ebbs and flows, right? Everybody said a couple years ago Tulane wasn't very good. Well, anybody that watched Tulane's team last year would say, well, Tulane's different. Mm-hmm. And so that's the nature. When we first got in this conference, Temple was unstoppable. Matt Rule had Temple rolling. Yeah. And you looked at about all the draft picks they had. So. It, 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 that's where we're at. It's a totally different deal. Ebbs and flows. And absolutely. I think that's why the parody of college football. So, um, yeah, Houston, Cincinnati, and UCF are great programs. But I think everybody watches what SMU's been able to do this offseason. Watch what UTSA's been able to do. Um, you know, just the, the amount of investment they're all making in their football programs. Um, we got to stay ahead of it. 
And ultimately, it doesn't matter if we're in the SEC or, you know, playing in the MEAC, right? We, we, our goal is to compete for championships every single year. Um, and no one will have higher expectations for the program and what we expect uh, to go out there and have success day in and day out than myself. Absolutely. Well, Coach, I appreciate you for joining me. Appreciate you, appreciate you for answering my questions. Uh, just want to wish you good luck this season. Again, I know you got a few months to continue to have roster management, continue to uh, to shape this thing up before the season. So just good luck. I appreciate you for joining me. Yeah, Christian, absolutely a blast. Good seeing you again. And thanks. Go Tigers. Thank you for listening to this episode of One on One. If you enjoyed this episode, leave a rating and a review wherever you download your podcasts. Also, like and subscribe to the Bluff City Media YouTube page. We will see you back here next time.